Kicking off the list at number 10, Stubbins Firth. Okay, this is one of the craziest science projects I have ever heard of in my entire life. Ugh, oh, so gross. Stubbins Firth, a researcher from Pennsylvania in the late 1700s. First of all, as you can probably guess, the 1700s, methods back then, they got a little messy from time to time, sure. A lot of firsts in the medical science world back then. Firth was a doctor in training at the time and he decided to prove to the world that yellow fever was not contagious. Yeah, imagine if you had Twitter. Firth would surgically insert vomit from patients with yellow fever into his own body. He would like put it in wounds all over his face, his eyes. He was trying to get it. He was going the extra mile, all in the name of medical research. Thanks, Firth. So gross. Even urine and saliva, anything DNA-wise, anything gross, just pour it in. That's it, all over. Firth, to our surprise, did not get sick. Hmm. Yeah, he was proud of that one too. He told everybody this new revelation. We look back now though and realize Firth just sampled late stage patients this entire time. So they were further along, much further further than the contagious period. Yeah, no one really knew. So basically, he volunteered to dump uh, all over his uh. Yeah, history is so gross. Science as well. Gets nasty. Number nine, Robert Liston. In the early 19th century, crowds would gather. They would gather to watch Dr. Robert Liston work. Yeah, he was known as the fastest knife in the West. I know, how many red flags can you find already in this one? A crowd, a fast surgery, what? What's going on? This was a time before anesthesia had been developed, so you wanted things wrapped up quickly, pun intended. He would have you amputated and sutured in three minutes or less. Nice. One in ten would pass away, but this was a time where those were good odds. Until it wasn't. Robert attempted to beat any record previously held that during a surgery, he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers by accident, as well as the, you know, patient's leg. But wait, it gets worse. Yeah. When he was swinging away, he also accidentally hit somebody else watching. Remember how I said crowds would gather, the old surgery crowd? Yeah, this is why you don't stand close. It's kind of like crump battles, you know? You can't get too close. Disaster is waiting in there. You don't want to get smoked with the Timberland. I'm glad surgeons are taking their time now. I'm also glad no surgeons are trying new experiments at a record time. That's also nice too. Number eight, the monster study. Speech pathologists, I have admiration for your profession. You all are amazing. You're literally miracle workers. Back in 1939, speech pathologists at the University of Iowa were determined to crack the secret behind stuttering. Yeah, they believed that it all began with young adults and their fear of public speaking. So these researchers decided to just intimidate people and try and induce stuttering. Like, oh no, don't do, like why? They got patients who were showing signs of stuttering and they verbally attacked them. They kept telling them that they shouldn't speak unless they're sure they can do so properly on the first shot. I'd be like, no, get lost. Yeah, that's confident, no. The experiment did not induce stuttering, it just induced anxiety and aggression and anger and confusion. Three of these patients later sued Iowa and the university for 925,000. Number seven. Jose Delgado. Okay, we're talking mind control now, so I'll give you a, give you a moment to put on your tinfoil hat. In the early 1900s, Jose Delgado graduated from the University of Madrid. He even lands a professorship at Yale University. Guy's killing it. But his mind was focused on others' minds. He was committed to mind control. His go-to method was these implants, like electrode implants with wires. He first used it with primates, as you could have guessed, horrible classic. He would use a remote control to make them do certain moves, even moving on to mind controlling a bull. Yeah, he got in the ring with said mind-controlled bull, but then oddly enough, the bull was calm. Weird. Almost like there's an implant in his brain and he's confused and doesn't want anything to do with that. Huh. How did he do it? Genius. Reports say that he stopped the bull last second before it charged at him. I say there's a thing in his head and he wasn't sure what was up. That's my vote. Poor thing. And then next, as you could have guessed, came the people. 25 people were tested with this mind control device by electronically controlling the brain. He believes armies could be controlled down the road. And until his death in 2011, he was upset. Yeah, he was upset he wasn't cited as often in terms of mind control projects in recent studies. Like, guy who mind control animals in the 1900s. Yeah, we're trying not to do that anymore. Maybe. Thanks. Number six, Ilya Ivanov. In the late 1800s, another old weird experiment with animals was underway. Here we go. Soviet biologists, they actually got permission from the country to breed hybrid ape humans. Yep. What did you get up to last summer? Ho oh, ho, let me tell you, my friends. Horrible. Who does this? This is crazy. Who thinks of this? They grafted an ovary into a chimp and the goal was to fertilize Nora, the chimp, with human DNA. Nightmare. So they inseminated a group of chimps. None of them got pregnant, obviously, so instead they tried to flip the project around. This time they had a human inseminated with the DNA of chimps. The volunteer number was obviously low. Luckily, nothing actually happened. This would have been an absolute train wreck. Before the project went underway, he was sent to Kazakhstan, and he thankfully didn't go up to any more science projects at that point. No mixing DNAs, nothing's going around. We're good. We like dodged that bullet, but oh, we got close. Number five, 
William Buckland, late 1700s, contemporary of Charles Darwin himself. Yeah, William Buckland, historically, he made some Jurassic waves. He was the first man to write a description of a fossilized dinosaur. He's into weird stuff, I guess. He's unfortunately also known for weird stuff more than, uh, you know, the dino discovery stuff. William Buckland would eat some strange dishes, all in the name of, you know, science and discovering new things with DNA. They were bored, I guess. He roasted hedgehogs, ostriches, panthers, bats, he ate everything. Like, I get it, it was the late 1700s, but eating these animals as often as he did, plus his brains? Now we gotta ask some questions. What's going on? What's the end game here, my guy? One of the most bizarre things that he studied up close and personal was the heart of King Louis XIV. Yeah, the way these scientists would handle tasks like old school testing, not ideal. Actually, quite gross. Number four, Francis Crick. Here we go, before we get really, really dark here with the science and health studies and stuff, we need to mention aliens. You heard me, tinfoil's on already, we're good. In the early 1900s, Francis Crick, the guy who discovered DNA alongside James Watson, two brilliant minds, dare I say life-changing discoveries, they also believed in directed transpermia, meaning that humans were put on this planet by aliens. Yeah, like extraterrestrials, like actual like aliens, like another species planted us here on purpose, like a science project. Yeah, scientists believe that they are a science project. Some of his methods, conversations to patients were obviously quite sketchy with these beliefs in order. Hey, let's talk about DNA. I'm brilliant. Also, did you know aliens left you here? Great, have a great day. Here's your bill. It's a lot of money. It's really old. Number three, John Bodkin Adams. He was once a general practitioner in the British community in Essex, and most of his patients were unfortunately elderly. And he treated said elderly patients with care. Now, there's obviously more. It gets dark. From 1946 to 1956, John had around 160 patients that all suspiciously died. And out of those 160, 132 of them just happened to leave valuables over for him. Yeah, he ended up dying a very rich man. What are the odds? Must have been some great care he was providing, eh? Not fishy at all. Of course, the wills were later found out to be fraudulent because, well, as for this list, it was the worst of the worst. And the worst part of all this? John was acquitted after everything. Yeah, his trial established that the doctrine of double effect, which is where a doctor giving treatment with the aim of relieving pain, may lawfully, as an unintentional result, shorten their life. So they're like, oh, it sometimes happens, so we can't punish him. Yeah, no. Look at the numbers here. So out of the dozens of cases that ended horribly, Adams was only charged for two. And he wasn't even convicted of their deaths even. He was just guilty of forging prescriptions and falsifying medical forms. He even reopened his practice. Yeah, although he was fined. He was fined only 2,000 pounds. The general public knew he'd taken the lives of at least eight people, so he didn't do much after that. But like I said, he ended up passing away rich at the age of 84. Number two, Morris Bulber. He was once part of the Philadelphia Poison Ring, which, yep, already you're like, oh, number two, we're already here. Here we go. Yeah, that was a real thing. How horrible does that sound? The Philadelphia Poison Ring. Okay, it was led by these two Italian cousins. It was led by Paul and Herman Petrillo. This was back in the 1930s. And these two brothers, these two bros, they were perfect for each other in a horrible, dark, disgusting way. Harold was the arson who knew how to make counterfeit money, and Paul ran an insurance scam out of the back of his tailor business. So already this awful duo exists, and then in comes Morris Bulber, this Jewish-Russian immigrant who believed in something called La Fatura, this magical practice that Italians from South Philadelphia believed in at the time. So bad, and then in comes crazy science, medical magic, just to make it better. Yeah, just add some spirit fingers into this horribleness. So Dr. Bulber would come in and give potions to patients, specifically patients from these cousins that they issued insurance policies from without medical exams. So they got this Dr. Bulber to then poison them with arsenic. The reason they had this scheme was because their insurance policies paid out the gang rather than the now widowed wives. How sad is that? This kicked off around 1931 and roughly 50 people bit the bullet before he was thankfully arrested in 1939. And yes, he turned the evidence over so those two cousins were also equally found guilty. Yeah, everyone's sentenced to death here. And finally, number one, Dr. Satan. There's a fun little nickname, Dr. Satan. Yeah, let's talk about this guy. Marcel Petio. It all started when he was young, as most of these do. He would get expelled from school, he had trouble with other students, and his first crime, his first adult crime, was mail fraud. Reminder, this was the early 1900s. Marcel was actually found to be mentally unfit to stand on trial after he was arrested, so later he joined the army. Yeah, that's the real sentence. That's the order that things happen in. The army later discharged him after he was caught stealing blankets. And come 1921, he decided to get a degree. Yeah, he began practicing in France, and at the same time in 1926, he became the mayor. Yeah, we have a medical doctor and mayor all at the same time in the early 1900s. This sounds like a Tim Burton movie already. I'm already nervous. The guy loses his spot as a mayor because he stole power from the city. Yeah, he stole power from the city, like a real villain, right? And in 1933, his crimes became historically horrible. YouTube doesn't like us talking about Hitler and the Yahtzees, but we'll rhyme them, you know, we'll uh, rhyme the algorithm. This is history, we gotta talk about it. Marcel would talk to Jewish residents while World War II was on 
unfolding and he would lie. He would say that he's going to assist them by injecting them with what he said was medicine. But after they'd passed away, he would steal all their belongings and dispose of their bodies in the basement. It's horrible. It's perhaps one of the worst things I've ever heard of. Come 1943, he was thankfully arrested. And after the liberation of Paris, he was found guilty for killing over 60 people. And in 1946, he finally met his fate via the guillotine. Number 10 on this list is human tails. If we take a look at the animal kingdom, tails are a pretty common thing. In fact, most birds, mammals, reptiles, and even fish have tails. Humans, however, for the most part, don't. Well, most of us anyways. There is a rare mutation that humans can be born with an actual tail. It's actually believed that very early on, as a baby is being developed in the womb, there will be a tail attached to this child. It's a very small thing that will go away, but for some humans, it never does. This makes a lot of sense because it's believed that humans evolved from creatures that would have had tails. In fact, pretty much all monkeys have tails, so it makes sense that at one point or another, we also would have had these little things poking out of our backside. Unlike a lot of other entries on this list, this mutation isn't necessarily necessarily super dangerous. For most people, they go on to live totally normal lives just with a tiny little tail. Obviously, it's got to be pretty bloody annoying though, because I feel like your entire life you'd just be perpetually sitting on your own tail, which would kind of suck. But there could also be some cool things with this too. Some people actually have the capability to move their own tail. Like they actually have control over the full thing. I don't think that they can swing off of trees or anything like that, but still, moving a tail around would definitely make for a pretty neat party trick. Number 9 on this list is reptile hearts. Let me paint you the picture here, folks. You're chilling out at your home, everything is good, it's just a typical day in your 59 year old male life. Boom, your chest starts to feel a bit strange, then it starts to get worse. The pains are significant right now and you think, holy mother of God, am I having a heart attack. You rush to the hospital just praying that you make it there in time and that your heart can hold on until then. You get there, but once you do, you get a very surprising report. The good news is that you aren't suffering from a heart attack and that death isn't totally imminent. The bad news is that you're slowly turning into a snake. Well, at least your heart is doing that. This is literally exactly what happened to a 59 year old man. How this happened, why this happened, and what we can do to prevent it are all things that doctors truly don't know. In truth, this was only the second time that this has ever reportedly happened. Now it's very possible that it's happened to other people and just hasn't been reported yet, but either way, it's still super rare. Being a snake would definitely be pretty cool, but I think I'd like to stick with my human heart if that's all right. Number eight on this list is multiple breasts. Having two breasts is honestly a pretty unique human thing. Think about all of the other mammals out there that have way more than that. Back in the day, it's believed that we would have evolved from creatures that had way more than two breasts. So why did this go away? Well, they're really just just wasn't any reason to have more than two. Cats, for instance, have more than that, but they also give birth to multiple offspring at a time, so there's an actual purpose for having them. Humans typically give birth to one other human at a time, and in very rare cases, two. Therefore, having more than two breasts just really doesn't make any evolutionary sense. However, the genes are there, we've done it before, and that's why, in rare cases, sometimes it happens again. What's kind of strange is that this mutation is way more common in men than it is in women. Women. And because it's way more common in men, these additional breasts often go unnoticed. The women that do end up with this mutation typically have these extra breasts removed. They can't really decide where these things pop up and having a breast growing in your armpit has got to be pretty uncomfortable. Number 7 on this list is Ectrodactyly. This is commonly known as a split hand or split foot mutation. Middle fingers or middle toes will usually be affected and in some individuals literally all four hands and feet can be hit with it. This sucks for everybody who has to deal with it, but especially those who have all their limbs affected. It's got to be brutal. Think about having to walk around or grab things like this. You can't. You wouldn't be able to. How are you supposed to drive a car or text on a phone or literally walk properly if it's your feet that are affected? This should affect people at birth, so if you don't have it right now, then you should be okay. Number six on this list is the Proteus Syndrome. Proteus Syndrome is a rare condition which will affect your bones, your skin, your muscles and literally all other tissues in the body. This mutation is really very scary and 
I feel for those who it affects. Basically, parts of your body will grow at a proportion to the rest of your body. This mutation is also asymmetric, so you may have your left leg get really big, but your right leg stays at a normal size. This syndrome can also affect literally any part of your body, too. Your face, nostrils, legs, arms, ears, you name it, and if you have this mutation, they might just get really big. This mutation obviously makes it very difficult for those individuals to live everyday normal lives and will often be struggling with it forever. It also makes it far more likely to develop tumors and some skin conditions that your everyday individuals usually don't need to worry as much about. If you're watching this video and you don't already have it, then you're probably good unless you're between the ages of 6 months and 18 months. That's when you typically notice the growth and from there on out, it's just going to continue with age. Number 5 in this list is hypertrichosis. Ever wondered what it's like to be the teen wolf? Well, if you develop this mutation, then this is probably as close as you're going to be able to get. Basically, this mutation is excessive hair growth. We're talking like serious levels of hair here, guys. Not just a scruffy beard, but full on locks growing out of your cheeks and everything. For a very long time, you'd often see people who had this disease working in the circus. Julia Pastrana is one of the most famous ones. She was born in Mexico in 1834 and made a name for herself in the circus community, becoming a performer and showing off her mutation. And honestly, shout out Julia. I have to imagine that it's very difficult being born with something like that, but Julia went out there, made the best out of a bad situation, so honestly, solid respect. Number 4 on this list is Unor Tan Syndrome. So this mutation is super specific and right now the scientific community is still trying to decide whether it's an actual mutation or if people are just trying to punk us. Let me explain. UTS is a syndrome that was proposed by the Turkish evolutionary biologist Unor Tan after studying 5 members of the Euless family in rural Turkey. These individuals all walked on all fours, all used primitive speech and appeared to have congenital brain impairment. It's very strange though because nobody really knows why this happened. That's why some people in the scientific community have come out and talked about how genetics have absolutely nothing to do with it. But if genetics do have something to do with this and this is a mutation, then it sounds to me like humans are straight up devolving. Losing all connection to our human characteristics and getting closer to dogs or other four legged animals. I don't know guys, this is a weird one. Let me know in the comments what you guys think it could be. Number 3 on this list is Fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva. Wow, alright, that was a mouthful. Well, for simplicity's sake, and so I don't embarrass myself anymore by mispronouncing this thing, we're gonna call this FOP from here on out. FOP is a very dangerous and rare condition that you do not want to get. This mutation literally causes your muscles and tissues to start to calcify and ultimately turn into bones. Yeah, you heard that right guys, you literally start to become just a bone. Basically a statue with skin over top of it. As you can imagine, movement can become very limited when you have this mutation and you'll have some other health issues arise as well. Breathing can be difficult and it can also become difficult to speak or eat. And that leads to other major problems that I don't even want to get into. This one is scary as all holy hell and really makes me appreciate the ability to move around. Number 2 on this list is trimethylaminuria. Wow, I swear whoever came up with these names is literally just doing it to mess with us guys. Alright, this mutation is definitely the stinkiest on this list. People who develop this mutation just literally can't break down certain smells. Their body is incapable and therefore these smells just sort of come off of their bodies at all times. Sadly, it's not rose petals or apple pie pie either. Of course, it has to be smells like rotten eggs, garbage, urine. Just absolutely gross smells that will be so overtly pungent that everybody in the room is going to be able to smell it. The worst part is, it doesn't matter how much the person showers or douses themselves in deodorant, they're not going to be able to get rid of this smell. And finally, number one on this list is Alien Hand Syndrome. I think that this one is by far the scariest thing on this list, guys. Alien Hand Syndrome is a mutation where you're literally no longer in control of one of your hands. Your brain can no longer control what your hand does and it just sort of acts as if it's got a mind on its own. I can't even imagine how scary that would be. Like imagine you're just driving your car and this alien limb just starts punching you in the 
sack. That's game over, dude. Like, there's no coming back from that. And this can happen at any age, and usually it comes after a stroke or some other deep trauma. So just kind of cross your fingers that your hand doesn't decide to go haywire on you. Kicking off the list at number 10, glowfish. I never had a fish tank growing up, but if I did, I probably wouldn't want any hybrid glowy fish bouncing around in there. That's for sure. I don't know. That's what lava lamps are for, no? That's a completely different vibe. You'd be doing this while you're trying to sleep. Trying to dodge out glowfish. Back in 2012, while the world was otherwise, you know, preoccupied with not dying or whatever was supposed to happen in 2012, Yorktown Technologies created a hybrid glowfish. They were first created out of zebrafish, but now there's a whole plethora of glowfish that you can purchase, not just the zebra kind. We got tiger barbs, we got rainbow shark, and betta. I don't know what betta is, but we got them, and they're glowy. We figured out how to make them glowy, I guess to hype up Avatar 2. I think that was supposed to come out back then. I don't see why we needed hybrid glowfish, but here we are. Bioluminescence is natural. We see octopus or deep sea fish that have it naturally, that's cool. But when it's not natural, you can tell. You know what I mean? It looks plasticky. It looks not right. Scientists in Singapore were originally aiming to modify fish to spot toxins in polluted water easier. But then on one hand, you're like, ah, oh, they're pretty mesmerizing. They're glowy, we like them, they're cute. Alan Blake, co-founder of said Yorktown Technologies, wanted them to glow only when near toxins. Yeah, this was back in 2003 when they first started. The guy wanted real life toxin notifications in the water. That's crazy. Oh, toxins, there we go. Good idea, but like, there's other ways, I think. Also, don't fish love shiny things? These guys would be lunch in like a matter of minutes. Today we're at a point where glowfish are being sold to houses for, for reasons. Do you want a glowfish? I, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I don't want any part of that. It doesn't affect them in any way. It doesn't hurt, apparently. Their skin just changes. I don't know. That kind of feels like a big deal to me. I'd be, I'd be like, what's going on? Help. Number nine, see-through frog. Yeah, just when you thought frogs were already hard to spot and catch, boom. Now they're invisible, pal. Good luck. Back in 2016, through artificial insemination, scientists successfully took the DNA of two kinds of recessive color mutant frogs. They took black-eyed and gray-eyed frogs, and then they did science. That's what they did. They just smacked them together, and they're like, whoa, that was so easy. They combined them together to create a frog whose skin is always translucent. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason for this. It's cool, but there's also a reason. The see-through factor allows observation of organ growth or cancer formation without having to cut into them. You know what I mean? Kind of helps when you can see the problem, right? No dissection needed for further study. That was the goal here, not bad. But imagine being see-through at all times. I'd be like, hey pal, my eyes are up here, okay? Quit staring at my pancreas. Gotta move on. Number eight. Savannah cats. This one has been talked about for a while now. It's pretty common, weirdly enough. How do we feel about Savannah cats? Let's talk about these little critters. In May 2012, the International Cat Association, I wanna work there, first of all, they registered this Savannah cat as a new official breed. It's official, the international cat community confirmed it. And it all started in the late 80s when Judy Frank crossbred a male several with a domestic Siamese. The offspring was appropriately named Savannah, yeah. Imagine if I was like, no, it's actually Amanda. I lied to you. They just called them Savannah cats for no reason. In turn, now we have cats with big ears. We did it, folks. We did it. Domestic cats mixed with wild African cats. I mean, it sounds like you're going to get another cat. And we did. Great work. I don't know how to tell you this. I mean, apparently they're great. They're not too crazy temper-wise, but they're fun and energetic at the same time. Apparently they're great for families. Yeah, I can't believe I'm saying great for families in a list that gets as dark as it's gonna get. Number seven, the Zorse. The Zorse. Yes, the male zebra, female horse. Now we get a really fun word. Zorse, the Zorse, sorry. It sounds like a god. Yeah, there's Thor, Odin, and then Zorse. Zebroids, that's their scientific name, they're usually quite common, historically. Charles Darwin even noted some in his work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses, donkeys, you name it, has been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. So they're very little petite little guys. In 2010, a Zedonk was born. It was a zebra donkey, but again, back in the 70s, this happened before, and no one really talked about it. There were three born in Colchester Zoo. Yeah, those zookeepers were like, hmm, how do we make zoos new and hip? Bizarre, humans are so weird. They're not too smart, humans. They're like, yeah, let's put these in a cage. It'll be fine. Number six, bees. I hate bees so much. When the window's closed, we're good. Remember when we had to worry about killer bees for a couple months, like a year ago? during an already dark time. Should we still be worried? Are these killer bees coming back? Are they a real thing? Hybrid bees, those are also, huh? Will hybrid bees fight the killer bees? Can we watch this? Can we tune in and watch this on Triller? An experiment in the 70s tried to change the hashtag bee game. And in turn, we got a brand new bee. 
Yeah, we love those. Just new bees to dodge outside. The idea at first was to take a regular honeybee and then breed it with an African honeybee. Ideally, we would get a hybrid bee that can safely safely provide more honey than a regular honeybee. Okay, that's steps. We're going towards the future of this one, right? On paper. The experiment obviously didn't work with these new bees and they didn't do that at all. And worst part of all, the bees got out. Yeah, imagine that email. To whom it may concern. Oh God, I left the door open, I'm sorry. These bees are aggressive towards other kinds of bees. They're not too nice, they're not too friendly. And they're very aggressive towards humans as well, in case you were wondering. And when these bees sting, their stinger stays with them afterwards so they can continue stinging multiple times with their stinger butts. Yeah, they don't fall off, right? That's our only hope when we see a bee the size of a tennis ball. We're like, uh, he won't, will he? Will he? I don't think. These bees would. Because they can. Yeah, hybrid killer bees. Victims have received 10 times the amount of stings as regular swarms. It's a lot, it's a lot of stings. It's a lot of movements from the bee's hips there. That's like some Caesar. That's like the Julius Caesar numbers right there. That's crazy. They react to disturbances 10 times faster and they will also chase said disturbance a quarter of a mile to find it. So yeah, don't sneeze. Hm. These bees have caused over 1,000 deaths. So yeah, I, I guess we should worry. We should definitely worry. Hit that thumbs up just because we're like, uh, no, there's, there's no, there's no good in this. That's scary, that's so scary. Hit that thumbs up for bee progression. Let's save the bees. Hit the thumbs up for the bees. Let's save all the bees except for those kind. The other ones are good. Number five, Tygons. Tygons be bygones. Ha <laughs> ha. He's good. I was gonna say Liger, but that's been used before. We know what that one looks like. Tygons were a real hybrid animal you could see for yourself at both the London Zoo and the Manchester Zoo once upon a time. This was of course back in the late 30s where folks didn't you know, bat an eye towards these kind of things with animals. Yeah, yeah, step on up and see the Tygon. A tiger head, a lion body, and a tiger tail. That's what happens when you put animals in the same cage. Come on out. Well, sometimes they'll get along too well in said cage and then you'll get a Tygon. Tygon hybrids were seen long before the 90s. Actually, in 1837, Queen Victoria was gifted a Tygon. Imagine that. I wouldn't know what to do with that. I'd be like, hi, what are you? Number four, Hiromitsu Nakachi. Stem cell biologist from Tokyo. This one is insane. Now we're getting to the dark ones here. Just recently, his experiments have been approved by the government, so things are actively in play here, not just, you know, Farmer Joe in the early 1900s. No, this is modern science. This is some Black Mirror type stuff here. Hiromitsu hopes to grow human cells inside of mice and rats, and then transplant set embryos into surrogate animals. A lot of animals, a lot of cells, a lot of traffic, a lot of moving around, and a lot of science, apparently. Cells into rats and mice embryos. How did we even get here? Who thought of this first? We went from the Salem witch trials to rodents being genetically manipulated so they can make pancreases for themselves. I like the word pancreas. I've been using it a few times lately. But his hope was that the rodent bodies would use the human cells to then make a pancreas for themselves. Here's the thing though, while conducting said experiments, they found that the rats were starting to develop a human type brain. That's when they pulled the plug on that entire project. Yeah, the second humans and animals get too close, governments will come in and go, stop. Number three, beefalo. Beefalo sounds like a Pokemon. It sounds like a thing that's close to being real, but shouldn't be. And that's where it should have stayed, if I'm being honest. The beefalo should have only been a concept. But then a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones did the impossible. Look at him go. One day in 1906, he said, hey, watch this, and then started breeding Arizona bison with domestic cattle in order to produce a hardy commercial animal. You know, just something new to make some money. He ended up giving up on this project entirely and then he just released the animals. Yeah, guy just got bored and released science projects to the wilds. What could go wrong? The beefalo then found their way into a national park where hunting was banned, so they thrived. And they thrived without natural predators at that. The population began to grow by 50% every single year. And at first you're like, wow, we did it. This is like Jurassic Park, but cute. No, their environmental impact was horrible. It was not ideal. They played God. They messed with the circle of life. You eat one bug, then there's a hurricane somewhere else. First off, these guys are very thirsty animals. They can consume 10 gallons of water each trip to a watering hole. They're like that one kid growing up drinking at the water fountain. You're like, guy. Save some, please hurry, I'm so thirsty. Yeah, they drank all the water. Every animal was so thirsty after. They also uh, in said water, so they ruined the entire water park for every other animal involved. Yeah, all bad. Entire ecosystems were messed up at this point. Everybody got thirsty because Charles Buffalo Jones was like, hey, watch this, let's try something new. Number two, don't try this at home. Not sure how many times I have to say this, but don't try any crossbreeding at home. 
or ever for that matter. Because things go south, obviously. For example, back in 2010, a woman named Julie Leroy was working as an animal control officer when an owner of a pit bull puppy said that she didn't want to keep her. This is normal, maybe a kid will come into the picture, maybe the dog's too aggressive, whatever, and then they have to give it back, okay. When Julie saw the dog, she was in shock. She was like, yeah, I'll take this living animal, first of all, I'm not a monster, thank you, I can do this. People who abandon animals, also, they're the devil, side note. This dog was different, but it wasn't mean. It was just a hybrid. It wasn't healthy, but all the more reason why you should stick around, know what I mean? The dog had a squished body, it had a huge jaw, and a bad underbite, and it was oddly shaped. That's because the dog suffered from short spine syndrome. That's because they got the dog from this backyard breeder who was carelessly breeding a bunch of dogs together, just for fun, not really knowing what he's doing. Thankfully, Julie did know what she was doing. She brought the dog home and gave her a loving home. Sweet little thing. Olivia and I want a dog so badly, so you know what, we'll take this hybrid little lady anytime. Her name's Kuda. She's in great hands, but look at her. She's so cute. And finally, number one, lions. Back in the 80s, the Chat Bar Zoo in Chandigarh, India, they tried this fun little science experiment for themselves. Yeah. They tried an experimental program, rather, where they would breed together domestic lions, little petite, you know, well, small in terms of a lion. They would mix them with these massive, beastly African lions in the hopes that they would meet in the middle somewhere and be introduced to the wild and help with the dying population of wild lions in India. Again, on paper, we wanted to get involved. We want to help restructure the lives of this animal, but the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. And it didn't. Obviously, it's number one. It didn't work. When the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a mistake. The cubs had weak back legs. They were having extreme trouble walking. And as they got older, their immune systems just started to fail faster and faster. By 2000, they'd bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. That's a lot of, it's a lot of projects, a lot of experiments. So they finally decided to stop the program, thankfully, and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction, which is so odd to me. Like, I'm not a fan of humans at all at this point. They're like, Hey, welcome to Earth. Yeah, it kind of sucks, right? It's hot. Okay, cool. We're going to stop making you now. Cheers. What? Naturally, thankfully, there are laws that prohibit officials from just killing these animals. So now they're just simply waiting for them to die naturally, which is it's better. It's certainly better, but still, stop messing with nature, guys. What do I have to, how many times do I have to tell you? Stop messing with nature. Mm -hmm.